Hey guys. All right, so uh, still continuing our talk on gas laws. Um, let's take a look at, waiting for the water thing to stop watering frogs. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, Charles's Law, okay? So Charles's Law, Charles's Law is basically a representation of a relationship between volume and temperature. Now, in this case, because it is a fractional relationship, I want to write the formula for it right here so you can see what I'm talking about. So it's going to be uh, V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So because this is a, uh, a different type of relationship, it's not multiplication on both sides, we have to make sure our units are a certain set way. So for this particular equation, you must take volume. It must be in liters. So if you're presented with a problem in milliliters, you got to convert it to liters. Okay? So let's take a look at what that means. So if I had a problem that said I had... 332 milliliters, right? Then I would have to convert that into liters and I could do a dimensional analysis problem, right? Where I know that in one liter, I have 1,000 milliliters. So really essentially what you're doing is you're taking the number in milliliters, you're dividing it by 1,000, and you're gonna get 332 liters. So that is something you have to be able to do. Uh, it's kind of just a, a simple one-step jump in a stoic problem. Or you could even think of it rationally. You go, well, I know that there's 1,000 milliliters. If I have 332 milliliters, and that's not quite one, so it's less than one. Okay? So you will have to make sure that whenever you put any numbers into this equation, that you first have the volume in liters. Okay? So volume has to be in liters. Now temperature, temperature here has to be in Kelvin. So Kelvin and Celsius, they, they do go up and down in the same increments. So you can actually use dimensional analysis if you want to, to convert between them. But just so you can remember this, we'll go this one more time. So at zero degrees, I'm sorry, at zero Kelvin, right? So this is my Kelvin scale, right? And this here will be my, um, my Celsius scale. There is degrees here. So at zero Kelvin, it's roughly minus 273 degrees Celsius. So we get up here and then we hit zero degrees Celsius, right? That's going to be 273 Kelvin. So again, as the same kind of increments, right? We get to 100 degrees Celsius, that's now 373 Kelvin. So you can see they increase and decrease at the same rate, basically because um, the Kelvin scale was based on the Celsius scale. And so they basically went, okay, so how many degrees colder is absolute zero? Because this down here, this is absolute zero and is the absolute coldest possible temperature that could ever exist. Now we figured out in you know recent times that we're actually off by a fraction of a decimal place, but for our intents and purposes, we're going to say absolute zero is negative two seventy three because they increase and decrease to the same in interval. And that makes our life a lot easier. So take a good look at that. Pause it if you need to. I'm gonna write that down. But um, let's see. So if I've got uh, something that was given to me in like say thirty six point three degrees Celsius. Well, I know that they're different by 273. So if zero degrees Celsius is 273, then all I'm doing is I'm adding 273 to our thing. So it becomes three, nine, one. So 319.3 Kelvin, okay? Remember, we do not use a degree when we talk about Kelvin because that's your SI standard that was set up in the 1960s to like worldwide use. Why add another word to, to translate into other languages? Just say Kelvin.
okay? So that is a, a conversion to that. Now, there may be problems, and I'm telling you, there is some in, in your weekly work this week where you have to get the answer in Celsius. So if you get um, 573.6 Kelvin, and I want it in Celsius, so here you added 273. Here, oops, you're gonna subtract 273. So again, so six goes down here, three minus three is one, seven minus seven is zero, five minus two is three. So this is degrees Celsius. So this is what it looks like when we go from Kelvin to Celsius, and this is what it looks like when we go from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, okay? So it's a matter of a difference of 273 between the two, and you have to be careful, because you cannot put a degree Celsius into the the equation, it's just not gonna work. It's not gonna give you the right answer. So you have to have your stuff in Kelvin. This relationship was determined by determining the relationship between meters and Kelvin. So that is what we have to have for this particular kind of problem, okay? So now that I kind of went over that, and I'll do it again when I talk about the the next law, the okay, Gay-Lussac's law. Um, let's try a practice problem. Okay, so let's go purple, huh? All right, so let's say you have well, let's say you got a pot in the stove, okay? And it's boiling, all right? It's on the stove, it's got some fire going underneath it, right? It's going. Well, inside the pot, you've got, you know, so many liters of water, okay? And let's say this is a sealed, sealed pot, right? There's a relationship here between uh, the gas that's being produced and the lid that's on top. So as I heat the gas up, that is inside the pot, right? So let's say inside here, this is where all the gas is, right? Well, you're starting to turn the water into water vapor, so you're increasing uh, the pressure, which we learned before also has a relationship with Boyle's Law. But in this case, it increases the volume because this is gonna wanna push outward, right? So as I increase temperature, my volume is gonna wanna increase. So that's one example you can use to think about it. Another example would be a hot air balloon. So when you see a hot air balloon on the ground, right? You see this great big balloon, it's kind of like just all laid out in the ground, right? And they heat it up, right? And as they heat it up, the hot air balloon, right? Becomes this big thing, right? So as a hot air balloon becomes all set up, uh, the volume on the inside is increasing because there's a little fire here, right? Heating the air up inside the balloon, which causes the volume to expand which allows it to displace the air around it, which means the whole thing can move upward. So that is a, a relationship with Charles's Law. So Charles's Law really gives us a good explanation for why hot air balloons work, okay? So that is something you can imagine. I mean, everybody's seen a hot air balloon, maybe in person or at least on TV or a video. So, and if you've ever been in a hot air balloon, kudos to you because I never have and I've always wanted to. And if you wanna check out a cool show on Amazon, it's called Aeronauts. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's about like like the initial what we were doing with balloons and trying to push the envelope, envelope getting way up there in the sky and almost dying because, you know, it's it's a crazy place to be without you know being inside a plane instead of being in a balloon. Yeah, I I loved it. It was pretty good. Okay, so Charles' law problem. So let's say your balloon has you know three hundred liters of gas inside, okay? Now, uh, the temperature is an ambient temperature because we take our, our, we don't actually record our regular temperatures around us in Kelvin. We usually do it in Celsius. Now, of course, in America, you do it in Fahrenheit, but, you know, we're gonna do Celsius for now. So let's say outside, it's like, you know, 26 uh, degrees Celsius, okay? So this is my initial, these are my initial temperatures. Now, I need my balloon, okay, to fully inflate so I can fly in the air. And the balloon's capacity is essentially, uh, let's say it's 4,200 liters. So what we need to do is find out what temperature do we need to make the gas to fully fill the balloon. So in this case, I do not know what my temperature is, and I want it in Celsius. So this is a common setup for a problem. You've got, this is your, again, this was your initial, right? And this is your final, right? So if you're curious about how that works, Julio, come on, ah, use my living eraser. Ah. 
So if you're wanting to know, uh, the V1 T1 is like my initial and the V2 T2 is my final, okay? And you can kind of look at the word problem to kind of see what goes where, but that's what you're looking for. And first off, you want to make sure your volumes and liters, and it is and it is, this is not. So we're going to have to convert that into uh, Kelvin. So we'll take our 26 and we're going to add 273 to it. We get 9, we get 9, and we get 2. So this is actually 299 Kelvin. And this here is something in Kelvin, but we will have to convert it back to Celsius when we're done. So remember that. That's a, a last step we're going to have in this problem. So we go ahead and we're going to plug everything in. So my V1 is 300, so 300 liters. My T1 is 299 Kelvin. My V2 is 4,200 liters. And my, um, my T2 is, uh, I have no idea. So I'm gonna put an X here, okay? So we're gonna solve for X. So this is an algebra problem, okay? So we take our 300 divided by 299, which, you know, that's pretty darn close to being Drop the calculator over here. So that's pretty close to being one, right? So but we'll still, we're gonna uh, keep it in there. So 300 divided by 299, and I get 1.03. Now, I didn't actually establish what sig figs were in this case, so I'm gonna do that here. That had three, this has four, that has two, and this we don't know, okay? So in this case, uh, I look at my whole problem and the least amount of sig figs I have is the uh, the two, right? Now, in this case, we're gonna use the Kelvin number, so we'll say three, just to make it fair. So three sig figs for the Kelvin number, because that's what's in our actual problem when we look at it. So our answer can ha only have three. So this right here is going to be one. So 1.00 is equal to 4,200 liters over X. So essentially it's gonna be this divided by this will equal that. So what divided by 4,200 equals one? Well, in this case, X is gonna be equal to 4,200 Kelvin. So this problem worked out really nice for us. Now, it doesn't always. Oh, great. So mid-video, we have a cat coughing up a hairball. Sorry, guys. Thanks, Julio. We all appreciate your contribution to science. Okay, time to get paper towel. <laughs> there it goes. Dude, what are you doing? What are you getting yourself into? So I'm back, sorry. Okay, so um, in this case, our Kelvin is equal to 4,200, okay? Uh, that's not our final answer though, because our answer has to be in Celsius. So I've gotta take the 4,200, and I have to subtract from it the, uh, the 273, right? That is the Celsius. Everybody kinda see what I mean by that? So 4,200 is different from Celsius by 273. So we're going to subtract 273. So we'll do our little math thing here. Three. Uh, my brain just died. Oh, yeah. One, ten. Uh, okay. Wow. How long has it been since I've done it like on a map? I don't, sorry. Yeah, we're going to edit that out. So in this case, X is going to be equal to 4,200 minus 273, which is gonna equal 0. Oh, wow, that was wrong. <laughs> and you get 300, uh, 3,000 rather, 927 degrees Celsius. Uh, but in our whole problem, we had three sig figs, so we're gonna have to uh, round it. So it becomes 300 and 93 zero degrees Celsius. So that will be your final answer for said problem. So that is an example of a Charles Law problem 
where you're going to use the relationship between um, volume and temperature. No, Julio, do not jump up on here again. And um, that is your example for that one. So as you can see, if my volume goes up, right, my temperature goes up. If my volume goes down, my temperature goes down. So we call this directly proportional, meaning that as one goes up, the other one goes up. As one goes down, the other one goes down, right? So they, they have a relationship together. They rise and fall together, okay? And that is Charles' Law. So now let me do the last one, uh, Gay-Lussac's Law, which remember, the name of the law is based on uh, the two people that figured out the relationships between it. It's not because the Lusak is gay. I know people go, oh, gay Lusak. Anyway, you know, kids. <laughs> or all kids, I guess, in this case. All right, so gay Lusak's law. So gay Lusak's law is a relationship between uh, pressure. And temperature. So pressure and temperature. Um, so the actual formula, I'll write it over here so you can see it. It's P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. So those are your relationships. So this one is also another uh, directly proportional problem. As pressure increases, so shall my temperature. As it decreases, so shall the other. That's just a relationship you should be able to recognize. Uh, in this case, a pressure here has to be in atmospheres. Atmosphere is basically designed, the, the, it's defined as being the amount of pressure that you would feel on your body exerted at you at sea level. So that's like the amount of atmosphere above your head, pushing down and on the sides. That's one atmosphere pressure. So atmospheric pressure, it has to be in atmospheres. Um, so sometimes you may not get it in atmospheres. You might get it in kilopascals. So kilopascals, right? This one has a relationship of 102.325, right? Um, basically, that is equal to, I'm sorry, kilopascals. Uh, 102.325 kilopascals is equal to one atmosphere, okay? Uh, so that's a relationship you're going to want to memorize or know. Uh, you can also do an internet search, do a conversion. I'm not really worried about it. As long as when you put it into the equation, your numbers are in atmosphere every time, okay? Uh, another one you might see is you might see tor or millimeters of mercury. Now, these are both based on the same kind of science. They're just different parts of the world around the same time. Uh, basically, they used to use a vat that was had mercury in it, and it has like a little tube on the inside. And as air pressure or pressure of any kind pushes down on it, the mercury would move up and down the tube. And basically, however many millimeters it moves from zero pressure, that is how much, you know, the, uh, the actual uh, pressure is. Julio, stay down. He wants to be on this board so badly. <laughs> um, so that's basically the uh, the amount of millimeters that it moves. So it, at one atmosphere, it's 760 millimeters, right? Uh, is uh, of mercury or a tor. It's the same same unit. It's just just that they had different names. Is equal to one atmosphere. Okay. So that is your uh, relationship there. So the reason why I tell you that is like say you've got a problem and it says that you have uh, 79.6 kilopascals of pressure, right? And you gotta convert that to atmospheres, okay? So to do so, I have to remember what my relationship here is. Uh, if I have this many, so I'll erase that equals atmosphere so I can show you what I mean. Uh, if this is how much you have, again, you're doing a stoic problem here. Um, there are 102.325 kilopascals of pressure in one atmosphere of pressure. So you know what you're essentially doing. You're just dividing these two together. Uh, 
and we put that in our calculator. So 79.6 divided by 102.325, and I get 0.779135. I got three sig figs, five, six sig figs, so three is what it can be. So that means that this is going to equal uh, 0 0.778 atmospheres, which kind of it, uh, it checks out because, you know, think about it. One atmosphere is 102. This is not even close to 102, so it's not exactly one atmosphere, so it's, le it's less. So you have to make sure that before you put this number into your problem that you're converted to atmospheres, okay? And the same thing goes with temperature. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. So if temperature is not in Kelvin, you'll get the wrong answer as well. So let's go ahead and do a Charles, uh, not Charles, um, Gay-Lussac's law problem. And honestly, this is why a pressure cooker works. A pressure cooker, you heat up the, the contents, it's sealed inside, the pressure increases, 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 and so does the temperature on the inside. And basically the two combine, it makes the food get really soft, it's got that insane pressure pushing on it, and also it gets that heat, so it breaks it down really nice. And that's why a pressure cooker works out so well. Not so much if you're like, you know, this is us type of happening. I know, I probably just got a bunch of, ooh. Anyway, so, um, all right, so let's do a problem. Let's see. Um, let's say that uh, you just threw your stuff in the pot, right? And it has, uh, mm, well, we'll do one, we'll do uh, the pressure we have in this room right now. So one atmosphere of pressure, uh, it's room temperature. So we'll say room temperature, let's we'll say it's about 20, 21 uh, degrees Celsius, okay? So this is our initial. Now, um, I'm going to heat up that crock pot to about, uh, let's see, 260 degrees Celsius, okay? So we're wanting to know how much pressure is that. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out, and again, this is your um, final set, or your twos, and this is your ones, so P1, P1, T1, and P2, T2. So first off, we need to make sure our temperatures are in Kelvin, right? So 21 degrees Celsius, so 21 degrees Celsius plus 273 Kelvin, and 273 is 294 Kelvin. 260 degrees Celsius plus 273 is 533 Kelvin. So these are going to be our numbers we put in. This will also be our baseline for our sig figs as well. Okay. So that's our, that is our moving forward. That's our, our, our sets we got. So now we just got to plug it in. So plugging it in, we just take a P1, which is 1. Uh, T1, which is 294 is equal to, uh, we do not know what P1 is, so that's our X. And then our final is, um, our T final is going to be 533. So in this case, uh, it's pretty, uh, if you know what, how things work here, you're gonna divide first this. So we take one, we divide it by 294, and I get 0.034, like a really tiny number, okay? Now, uh, this is like, X divided by this becomes this answer I have on my, my calculator, right? So if I'm trying to solve for that, that means I have to essentially multiply both sides by 533. So I'm going to multiply that by 533. And what I get is going to be equal to 1.81292517. Okay. And again, we're looking at our sig figs. We got three and three. Uh, that's an infinite number, right? We're going to say this is infinite. We'll say, I actually didn't, you know, let's say that it, we're at room, we're at room air pressure, one atmosphere, you know. I probably should say 1.00, but we'll, we'll say 1.00 just to, to fix our, our sig fig issue here. So 333. So I go right here, and my answer is going to be 1.81. Uh, we're looking at atmospheres. 
So essentially I doubled my atmospheres and I was able to increase the temperature up to 260 degrees Celsius. So that is essentially, or if I just, if I just doubled the temperature up to 260 degrees Celsius, then my pressure would be 1.1 atmospheres. They're related. So most pressure cookers, they actually increase the pressure, which increases the heat, which makes it cook. You don't usually have fire under it. Now, like if you have a sealed pot on your stove and you're cooking it with fire underneath, then you're using heat to turn up the pressure. If you're using a pressure cooker, you're using a pressure to turn up the heat. It's a relationship, okay? And that is a uh, Gay-Lussac's Law problem, and that is all you need for this week. So uh, holler at me if you have any other questions or if you need any other kind of assistance on this. Um, otherwise, please check out other videos you can find on the internet as well, the textbook. Um, and hopefully uh, you find this a lot easier than we, when we did stoichiometry itself, okay? And um, I will see you all on Monday and Tuesday for your next Zoom session. All right. And I am out.